Welcome to Stock Odds, Odds and End podcast. I'm Dave Singh here with Rob Friesen, getting ready for the week ahead. Good evening, Rob. How's everything? Oh, busy, busy weekend, but uh, we're here. So uh, after this, we got our own homework to do, uh, <laughs> right? Get ready for uh, next week here. Yeah, middle of the month already. We've got data, we've got news, we've got opinions, we've got hunches. I mean, <laughs> we've got well, all think, kinds of stuff. I think... Um, <laughs> Last week on our podcast, I said, didn't I say something is going to break? <laughs> Something's going to break. Well, we we had a break this week. Uh, FTX, <laughs> not in the not in the stock space, but uh, certainly uh, uh, crypto is uh, quite widely followed. That was uh, that was quite a collapse, eh? It's huge, but FTX. you had things like Tesla. Yeah, but you also had things like Tesla down to all time to 52 week lows, 177 on that. And uh, even the big caps, huge drawdowns right before the the rally started. But well, I mean, so I think I think Tesla could be summed up into more what the concerns are with um, you know what's what with the distraction that uh, Twitter is, and also a possible continued supply of Tesla stock coming Tesla out stock from coming out of these things. things. Yeah. And then, of the Bitcoin relationship. Um, I'm, I'm got an echo here. I can't. It's echoing back again. Here. That's gone away now. Okay. Um, so that uh, definitely, you know, we're seeing a lot of uh, pressure in the uh, crypto space because of that. I mean, people, people have to take they have to take serious note of what that really means um, because I mean that pulled in a lot of investors that even had done their due diligence and still were duped and uh, and so they're not going to be as thrilled to uh, to go into the next venture so I think it's really going to harm this the crypto space for sure for a while anyway and uh, some of these tech, technology stocks that have had exposure to Bitcoin and stuff, obviously, are going to be under pressure a bit. Anyway, what do you got for seasonality this uh, week? We uh, we Friday we started the first day of the mid month seasonality, and November is usually a, a very good month for equities. I I have rarely, rarely, rarely seen a a bad month for equities in November, but um, you know we could always still have that. So far, going okay. Um, but what do you have for mid-month seasonality and some of the other things you came up with here? Yeah, so um, mid-month is expected to be pretty strong for small caps relative to um, the diamonds and QQQ. So small caps and spider um, are expected to do better. And then within that, we have some sectors of interest and. Um, so here we go. Spider is expected to do 0.30% for the month. Uh, sorry, for the mid month, and IWM 0.74. So a lot more strength in small caps. And then things you might want to be longer based on the stats are gold, GDX, and GDXJ. Both of them are expected to do 1.4 or 1.8%. And ARCKK uh, is expected to do 1.57% for mid month. We've got oil, semiconductors, uh, KRE, banks, XOP, XLF, basic materials, industrials. These are expected to do at least 0.5% or greater for mid-month. And things to be shorter are silver, utilities, and the QQQ and XLK and XLC. So if you think of some of the big cap uh, technology stocks, your Googles and whatnot, um, they may be a little bit weaker uh, or or better shorts for the for the for the mid month and uh, go along some of the things like gold or gold versus silver, long gold, short silver. Uh, and there's also for XLU, there's a lot of rotation out of utilities in the past week and month. And a lot of that has to do with um, just a risk risk on sentiment in general. But X, utilities have been weak for the last month or so. And our 10 years still there at three point. 88, which is still way below the 4.2 or so just a couple days ago. So that's also um, something to watch there. 
and um, we got, we've got Friday was a big day for China. Uh, we could see that it being an undertone for risk on for the for the week ahead as well. And uh, yeah, that, that's those are some of the themes I was watching. And um, in terms of data and economic reports coming out, uh, Tuesday might be a good one. Uh, producer price index that could be a mover. Monday is just uh, the New York Fed's inflation expectations, but they've been wrong on those so many times. But the, PP, the PPI is the one on Tuesday to watch. And then the rest of the week, Wednesday, we have retail sales, industrial production, Thursday, initial jobless claims and housing starts, and Friday, existing home sales. So the themes will be home sales, joblessness, industrial production, retail sales for the, for the week in terms of economic reports. Um, that's what I have here. What do you want to go over next, Rob, here? Uh, the future? So we well, we have, um, you know, when you guys are curating your list from stock odds regarding, you know, opportunity, uh, just just bear in mind that, um, you know, we had two really substantial up days, Thursday and Friday, um, that lifted lifted the markets kind of beyond the most recent um, resistance point, and we've got in our sights. Um, some some reasonable targets that that kind of relate back to all the consolidation that happened between February 24th low and um, you know, kind of our July you know July uh, time frames there we had we had a lot of consolidation there so there's there's something to target but when you you come out of the gate and you go so far and, and so fast. Um, there is a, a chance that you could get a pullback, even even with, for example, seasonality saying that the markets should be okay. Um, it's already moved more in the two days. Well, the, the one day of seasonality was a Friday for mid month, but I mean, you got to factor in how much something has already gone. So when you're choosing a side, like let's say, for example, you you wanted to pursue risk on and you choose consumer cyclical you know so discretionary stuff you choose technology you know, go into the semis and some of the other tech areas um and you you know you short maybe consumer staples and utilities because you know that would be the typical risk on but if we say we open up on monday and then we have a pullback day you know, you could see uh, losses from that that are, you know, greater than you know what you might have made even on Friday. It, it's it's possible to have a a really bad session when you're taking a side like that. So the better approach could be after we have these bigger moves to, you know, be more diversified, not have as much exposure to any one group. Um, you know, just stick with your odds and average performance in a more diversified fashion. So I call that, I call that kind of a neutral basket, right? More of a, you refer to it, Dave, as a quantitative basket. It's just simply uh, a diversified selection of stocks that have the the numbers supporting them, right? Rather than shift it towards either risk on or risk off, where you're more concentrated into a few groups. Make, does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. So so that's that's the tension that you have after big moves. Um, it really works for you well when you have a, a nice decline over multiple days and you get down to a support level and then you have a catalyst kind of turning the market around. If you select a risk on environment for that turnaround day, you're going to have exceptional returns. And that's kind of what we saw on Thursday with that catalyst, of course. But but look what happened on the Wednesday before we closed on the on the down note. So it was a kind of a perfect setup for a, a outlier performance day. Um, and the reverse can be true if you press if you have a, a big up session for a few days in a row and then you you press too much for risk on and it reverses on you, you know, you'll have the opposite. You'll have a disproportional loss day. 
So just um, keep that in mind. Um, we see the futures right now. Run through them. They're off a little bit, not much. Um, the Dow did not really participate too much in Friday's rally. It did make a new high relative to Thursday, but it did close about where it opened. So um, it wasn't one of the better performing groups. And right now it's off 0.24%, so 80 points. The S&P 500 did have a better showing than the Dow on Friday. It did continue and, and closed, you know, in the top 25% of its uh, range for the day. So it... Um, it did okay, and right now it's down 0.29% or 11 and three quarter points. Um, targeting another level, if it keeps on climbing, would be to go up to September 13th high. That's what you want to take a look at there. NASDAQ um, had a really good day on Thursday and followed through on Friday and closed in the top. 10% of its range, so maintain some strength there. Currently, it's off 0 0.50 or 58 and three quarter points. So it's performing a little bit worse on the futures right now than the other two, but it also had the better performance. And then Russell, um, you know, had a interesting day. It, in the big scheme of things, it wasn't as depressed as the other markets, the SPY or the NASDAQ. Um, kind of coming into this week anyway. And so it popped up on Thursday, huge. I mean, our Russell 2000 list that we curate, the top 20, it did 5% by itself, 4.99% to be exact. Um, and that was just a long list and hedged, it was still fantastic. Um, and so that was Thursday's performance. And it wasn't specifically chosen as a risk on for Thursday. It's just uh, the, the day was a monster and, and the stocks participated. Um, and then on Friday, it kind of opened a little bit up, 0.20%. And it pulled back a bit, chopped around a lot. It did make a new high, but it closed in the bottom uh, two thirds of uh, bottom third of its of its range for the day, so it didn't have a massive uh, you know closing thing. It's currently down 032 percent or six points, um, and it's a lot closer to the September 13th high than the than the spy or the Qs. Uh, actually, the Qs is um, yeah same thing September 13th high. The reason for the September 13th high being pointed out is that was the reversal day like we opened and we rallied and then we came back and what's interesting about that that corresponds to everything from february 24th and all the stuff in march and all the stuff in may and then into june and back into august and even into september like they all they all correspond so there's matching highs, lows, closing, opens, lots of consolidation. And so that's our target if we do continue up is this September 13th high. OK, that's how markets work. You know, we often go right back to a consolidation spot or a floor. That was there previously, so. Um, let's look at energy. I'm um, I'm leaning more to the bullish side on oil overall, especially with China reopening. Uh, it's it's probably going to have its fits and starts in that, but um, nonetheless, I think the oil demand is definitely there. We don't see, um, you know, s still a a free flowing oil tap in that sense. I mean, the, the, the economy has a lot of problems associated to energy just because uh, supply chains still are they're still in a hangover from, from the COVID period. Uh, not all the production has come back online. The investment for the industry is certainly not there. I mean, you'd think it would be, but it's very political. And it's, and it's 
political on a global level as well. So while everybody needs fossil fuels at this point in time, that's not the long range goal. So that's why you're going to have some headwinds. But at the same time, what does that create? It creates um, kind of a vacuum in the fact that it's very easy to go to not enough supply to meet all the demand and other technologies aren't uh, able to uh, fill the gap or, or keep up the same. So it's very easy for us to, to move to, you know, head back to uh, March, uh, you know, highs that we had in uh, crude. I think that's something that we have to accept and acknowledge that it could happen. No guarantee, but definitely could happen. Uh, Dave, you and I talked about um, metals um, and how yes. what an opportunity uh, that was for gold. Um, and so it has done what we said. Like it listens to us, I guess, hey? Eh? Right? We said gold should uh, move higher and it listens to us. Hmm, interesting. It listens to you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was a nice, I mean, if you go back and look at the chart, all we were looking at was the support level that it had achieved and the fact that the dollar had just started to weaken a little bit. And we said, if this sentiment continues where the dollar can pull back, gold and other commodities can, can really launch. And so we've had that launch. Basic materials have, have done well. And, um, and looking at the dollar, what is it doing as of now? It's up a little bit, 0.56%. I wouldn't be surprised uh, with a retracement type day because of we've had two very, very significant down days in a row, um, you know, much larger than other times in history for move of the, of the U.S. dollar. So with those, you know, dropping essentially, um, well, just from the open, like 110, 1, 111 to you know, 106, just 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 shy of 106. So uh, pretty big move over two days. So I wouldn't be surprised if it does an inside day, retraces a bit. So what is that going to do? That puts a little bit more caution on the commodities. So if you're expecting, you know, metals, basic materials to do really well on Monday, again, please reference the dollar to see what it's up to, because that'll be a contributing factor for sure. So, um, you know, in the last month and a half, it's been primarily the dollar that's been contributing to, um, you know, the market's willingness to bounce up and rally, the commodities being willing to bounce up and rally. Um, so we have to keep an eye on a, one of our leading indicators for sure, relative, not to everything, but relative to some of these groups. Okay. So I guess uh, you know, for tomorrow, I would say just be careful about the stocks that have run a huge amount. So we had one of our... Um, subscribers send me a list to say you know can you check can you check this list and, and it was nasdaq stocks and uh, i checked it and it was a number of longs and a number of shorts derived from nasdaq i looked at the stocks and they had all been up you know significantly on friday so you're going to have a better balance there when you're if you go long on monday those those stocks that were up a lot, but you're also shorting other stocks that were up a lot. I think that's a little bit safer approach um, because you're hedged. And if you have the odds and the average performance still showing really well for those long stocks that you're selecting and the short stocks you're selecting, the odds and average performance are, you know, essentially negative, um, then you're just following your your numbers, you're following your data. If you've got, if, if that was derived with multiple ducks lined up, 
um, you've got a strong argument for relative performance, and that is simply your long dollars outperforming your short dollars. And um, if you keep it essentially spread out like that, equal dollars, um, you should have a reasonable day. So that's the thing. If, if on the other hand, you were being really, really selective and you said, well, I'm, I'm going to only short this one that was up a lot and I'm going to buy this one here that was not up very much, you could have a problem where the strong stock continues to rally and your lagger stock just doesn't participate, right? Um, on, on the other way around, if you went long the one that was up a lot and short the one that was hardly up, you might have a problem where the one that was up a lot drops because we have a, a bad day, maybe the, maybe Monday, maybe this is like, I don't like Mondays type of day. You have a bad Monday and it pulls back, then uh, you're going to get harmed. So what I'm saying is, if your list was kind of similar, where the longs were up a lot and, 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 and pretty much everything was up a lot anyway, so your longs are up a lot and your shorts are up a lot, you probably find you come out of it a lot better, a lot, a lot more uh, even performance that way. Okay. I like that approach. Well, I mean, it's 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 what you have to deal with after big move days, right? So it's not the same as when you're curating a list where it's just been an inside day and no catalyst and nothing else going on, right? You know, it's easy to come up with a fairly neutral list it's easy to come up with a diversified thing it's you don't have to worry so much about the stocks that were up or down a bit but when you have these huge move days especially with contributing factors like the dollar and you know um, bonds and stuff like that then um, yeah it can be it can be a bit of a concern how you curate your your lists so you got to first of all stick with the quantitative data, but there might be just, you know, just looking at it and doing a visual inspection and thinking about what your exposure is like. Okay, let you go. Have right, a good one good. tomorrow there. Yeah, Good luck. cheers.